In England, in the decades before the 1560s, there were no permanent buildings dedicated to theatre. Instead, travelling bands of actors and musicians performed their plays wherever they could attract a crowd. Originally, plays were performed in London either in large indoor spaces, so guild halls or travelling around the country, town halls, in court, banqueting halls, in old monasteries. So one place was a large indoor space and you put a stage in it. Another place where you would perform would be a large outdoor space. Um, these were often things like inn yards because an inn yard is enclosed and what you could then do is you could charge people at the entrance to the inn yard itself. And then ultimately, London gets large enough just about to sustain a permanent theatre. And the first professional uh, fixed theatre we know of is called the Red Lion. And the Red Lion was built in 1567. Although it's often said to be the first permanent theatre, it wasn't much of one um, and it didn't last seemingly longer than a year. It's not until 1576, to be precise, that a proper permanent home for London theatre is built in Shoreditch, called, quite simply, the theatre. We have to understand that London has, it were, two controlling uh, organisations. One is the City of London Corporation, which loosely represents the money, moneyed classes of London. And then off to the west, in Westminster, outside of London, is the home of the Crown, the monarchy, the other great force, and those two forces are essentially locked in a struggle for power. Um, this struggle culminates in the English Civil War. In our period, in the late 16th, early 17th century, one of the means by which they carry out their struggle is theatre. That is, they, they sponsor theatre or they try to stop theatre. At the start of this struggle over the theatre, in the earliest period of permanent London playhouses, the most influential entrepreneur was James Burbage. There was a man who was originally a joiner and who then became an actor, and he was called James Burbage. And James Burbage decided, or it seems to have been his decision, to build a round outdoor theatre. And he therefore, in some sense, created professional theatre and what it looked like for early modern London. The story thereafter is that this design that James Burbage, an actor, has originated, which is an open-air outdoor amphitheatre, loosely modelled on Roman amphitheatres, but with a lot of Tudor, as it were, vernacular touches, so made out of wood, for example, not out of marble. Um, that style is copied. James Burbage was an entrepreneur with an actor's mind, and he must have noticed that, that London was large enough to sustain a professional theatre, or he must have guessed that it was. Also, laws in London had become much stricter about performing in inns. And basically, players were being sent out of London. So um, he must have thought, well, now is the time then to set up uh, a big permanent theatre just outside the walled city of London, but hovering near a gate. A popular venue run by James Burbage for more than 20 years, the theatre is believed to have been the place where William Shakespeare's early plays were staged. Among these was almost certainly Richard III, written around 1592. Put up your sword. Say then my peace is made. That shalt thou know hereafter. But shall I live in hope? All men, I hope, live so. I loved you grabbing your hand and yeah. lifting it up. That was, uh, that was really nice, and holding her on and closing her poor heart. Look. I go my ring and compasseth thy finger. Even so thy breast encloseth my poor heart. Where both of them, for both of them are thine. Things change in 1594, when what appears to happen is that what has been called a duopoly is built up. That is to say that only two companies are formally allowed, one in the theatre and one in the rows. Um, in the theatre you have the Lord Chamberlain's men, for whom Shakespeare is writing, and James Burbage's son, Richard Burbage, who's the great actor of the time, he is acting there. Among the great roles associated with Richard Burbage is Shakespeare's villainous Richard III. For he was fitter for that place than earth. And thou unfit for any place but hell. Yes, one place else if you will hear me name it. Some dungeon. Your bedchamber. 
Ill rest betide the chamber where thou liest. So will it, madam, till I lie with you? I hope so. I know so. For all the success of his venture, the proprietor, James Burbage, had a problem. What happens is the theatre that he has so successfully run uh, is built on ground that he doesn't own. He owns the theatre, uh, he doesn't own the field on which the theatre stands. The man who owns the field, Giles Allen, decides he won't rent it anymore. So James Burbage now has a su successful theatrical company and a successful theatre, but doesn't own the ground on which his theatre is built. So he needs another theatre. And he buys for a huge sum of money uh, a bit of the upper freighter, the upper dining room of the old Blackfriars Monastery, and sets up the second Blackfriars Theatre there. And it is his intention that the company will move from the theatre to that space. But it took a lot of money. The conversion was very expensive. And the Burbage family, indeed, sunk everything into this new venture and intended to move the Chamberlain's men into this theatre, a much smaller space, um, a few hundred people rather than several thousand, as the uh, outdoor theatres could hold. But each person was paying much more or was expected to pay more than they would in the outdoor theatres. It was a, an upscale move, essentially. This was a, a classy thing to do. But unfortunately, just as the theatre was being completed, the Burbage family learnt that they couldn't occupy it. They had essentially a petition of local residents to contend with, including, indeed, their own patron, who lived nearby, who objected to this uh, development within the heart of London. So, having put all their money into the Blackfriars Theatre in 1596-97, the Chamberlain's men couldn't occupy it. Another outdoor playhouse, The Curtain, had opened in 1577, just 200 metres or so from the theatre. James Burbage appears to have been on good terms with its owner, Henry Landman. So the company moves into the Curtain whilst they start making plans to build the Globe Theatre. And what they do, they haven't got that much money because they've ploughed so much into Blackfriars. So they reuse the old timbers of the theatre. The old lease gave them the right to erect any buildings on this piece of land that they wanted to, and but also gave them the right to take away anything that they'd built. This turned out to be a crucial clause, the taking away option, which is precisely what they did. When they finally um, couldn't stay any longer, they first of all performed at a nearby theatre they had access to called the Curtain. But in the winter of 1598, whilst the landlord was out of town, they dismantled their old theatre. Convey it across the Thames and rebuild it as the Globe, a, a process that takes about a year. And what we don't know is whether the Globe was more or less the theatre simply rebuilt, or whether the Globe merely used the timbers that made up the theatre and was a spanking new, fantastically different uh, being. This hand, which for thy love did kill thy love, shalt for thy love kill a far truer love. To both their deaths shalt thou be accessory. I would I knew thy heart. It is figured in my tongue. I fear me both are false. There never was man true. Well... Well, put up your sword. So then my peace is made. That shalt thou know hereafter. By the time that Richard Burbage was acting on the stage of the Globe, his father James had died, leaving Richard and his brother Cuthbert to run not only the new Globe, but also the problematic Blackfriars. But they owned the Blackfriars, or had at least, uh, they owned the theatre and had a lease on the land and their stopgap solution was to rent it out to other companies. Not professional actors, the local residents would not tolerate professional theatre in their street, but there was a way around this. Boy actors, companies entirely composed of boys, who were receiving acting education as part of their general education, might be allowed to perform, say, once or twice a week, in what was technically, legally, an open rehearsal for which money was taken, rather than professional performance. 